Okay, welcome to my bonus lecture on tributary area and tributary width. There will be some elements from this in the assignment and quiz, um, so feel free to watch this during the tutorial time slot. Um, uh, the TAs will not have an hour's worth of stuff to go over uh, during the tutorial, so feel free to watch some of this. So a tributary area is the area of load that impacts the design or deflection of a structural element. Now you've heard me say everything you need to know about structures you already know, and I think intuitively most people get what tributary area and tributary width is. I even talked about earlier in the lecture, if I sat in the middle of this table, you intuitively know that half of my load goes to this side and half of my load goes to this side. You also know that if I sat directly over this particular column, you know that like 99.9999% of my load goes right into this column right here. So these are things you intuitively know. If I was just talking about the table itself, how much of the table load do you think goes into each of the four corners, each of the four legs that hold it up? You would probably intuitively say 25% or a quarter. You would cut this table into quarters in your mind and put that portion of load on each leg. And intuitively you do that. When I said how much of this load goes to that side and how much of go the load goes to this side, you intuitively drew a cut line down the middle and imagined half going there and half going here. What we're going to do is formalize that just a little bit to help you understand that. I often like to help people think about tributary area that really struggle with it by thinking about it as something they already understand. And that is a watershed is a really way, a really good way to help you think about it. You know that in a watershed like the size of the Mississippi, uh, which starts in Ohio and goes all the way down into the Gulf of Mexico, that it could be snowing in Ohio and sunny in Texas, or you could be getting a hurricane in Texas and snow in Ohio, um, meaning that not the same load happens everywhere in a particular tributary at the same time. You know that it might not be the same load, even, the same load type even. Um, so there are things intuitively that you do understand when we talk about a watershed. So if you, came, if you were walking through the woods and you came across this body of water, you would look at it and say, oh, a river. That's a pain. How am I going to get across? And you would, wouldn't think about it anymore. If you were walking through the woods and you came across this, you would say, oh, a river. What a pain. How am I going to get across? It would only be knowing that it was part of a system that it was smaller than this part that you might give it the name a creek. To you, they're both rivers if you run into them in the woods. We only tend to give them this designation as a hierarchy to help us figure out which one's the bigger one than the other. Same thing. If you were walking through the woods and came across this, you would say, oh, a river. That sucks. How am I going to get across? Knowing it flows into something bigger, which flows into something bigger, is why we might call it a stream. Now I'm making up the kind of hierarchy of these names, but you get the idea. And a stream doesn't necessarily have to flow into a creek. We could have a stream that flows directly into the river, but we're calling it a stream because it's roughly that amount of water happening. Well, we could then have another one. If we came across this in the woods and we tried to get across it, we'd say, oh, a river. That sucks. How are we going to get across? It's only knowing that it is much, much, much smaller than the biggest river that we would maybe break it down and call it a brook. So that is why we could have multiple names for what is kind of the same thing. They're all rivers. If you ran into one on its own, you would call it a river. You wouldn't think anything of it. 
but when you're talking about it as the system, you might give them different names to differentiate in your mind that the river is the one with the big flow and the brook is the one doing less work. Basically, the river is working hard, the brook, the brook is doing the least amount of work. And that is going to kind of follow through in our, in our hierarchy of beams and how we label beams. We could have rain over here and snow over here. So we could have different loads over different parts of our tributary that all eventually come down to our river. So if we were talking about a river and we said, what's the load on the river? Well, you'd have to look at what the load was on this component and what the load was on this component to be able to figure out what the load is on the river. There's not one load happening seamlessly across the entirety of this watershed. You can have different loads acting on different areas that all impact this river. So you might have to add them up. The brook might have this zone of tributary that impacts it. And we could have this stream being impacted because these brooks run into this stream impacting this. Is your battery dead? Yeah. Sorry. Um, uh, um, so we have this tributary area for this stream. We've got two brooks that flow into it, so we have the tributary areas from both of those brooks and the little bit that could be coming directly into the stream itself. The creek, we have all four brooks, two streams, and the little bit of itself that's directly going into it that never actually makes it into the creeks or the streams. And then our river, the tributary for this river is the entirety of this tributary, incorporating all of these components, and some of it is going directly into the river and never going into any of the creeks or brooks or streams that make it up. It's the same process with a building. What if we thought of our river as a column and our, uh, what was next, streams as our girders? Now, what's a girder? A girder is a beam. Don't worry about it. A girder is a beam. And we could have our beams, but you just said girders are beams. Yeah, the same way both a stream and a, a, a creek are both rivers. We could have beams and girders. It's just that the girder is a beam that is working a little bit harder than a beam. And then we have purlins. What's a purlin? It's a beam. Don't worry too much about it. It is just the type of beam that is doing very little work. So a purlin is not doing much work. A beam is doing a medium amount of work. And a girder is doing a whole lot of work. And then our columns are doing the most work. So if you want to think about that as our hierarchy, well, remember we had snow over in one spot and rain over another and it wasn't the same? Well, what if this was our fourth floor lot live load over here and this was our fifth load live? They could be different live loads. They can have different tributary areas that all come down and impact the column. What if we did that same thing, drawing it as an actual building? Well, We've got our columns. We've got our girders. They're the ones that are doing, they're the type of beam that are doing the most work. Then we have our beams. They're doing a little bit less work than the girders. And then we have our purlins, which are doing the least amount of work. The way I think of it, purlins support a deck, beams support purlins, and girders support beams or transfer columns. So girders are the ones doing the really big, hefty job that is outside of normal. Beams are, could still be supporting deck. It doesn't mean they can't support deck, but it usually means they're also supporting purlins or open web steel joists. Purlins and open web steel joists will kind of use them um, kind of in a similar fashion. And we could have our loading in different spots on this system. Now, the tributary width is saying, let's not talk about 
that entire area, let's not say that that's the area, what if we just thought about how wide that tributary was? So remember our tributary area was a whole shape. What if we just thought about how wide that tributary was? So just one dimension of our tributary area, and that's our tributary width. And that's really handy when we want to talk about the linear load on something. So the way I think about it is the way we were thinking about the table. So you knew that each of those legs was taking a quarter of the load. Well, look at this table though. There's a beam here and a beam here, and the table is spanning across. You know that this beam is taking half of the table, and this beam is taking half of the table. The tributary width for this beam is half of the table. It doesn't change the fact that a quarter of the table load is still going into this column and that a quarter of the table load is still going into this column because this beam spans from column to column. So half of this beam goes to this column and half of this beam goes to this column. So we can figure out the tributary on this column in multiple different ways. We could look at what the table does to the beam and then look at what the beam does to the column. Or we can just look at the column by itself, knowing that eventually it has to get there. So let's look at a very simple, basic, basic, basic roof plan and talk about the tributary widths and the tributary areas for the various beams. Remember, so this, this double dash line remember, is an open web steel joist. And I said open web steel joists are very, very, very similar. An, uh, an open web steel joist is just a very special custom type of purlin where it's like the ziggy zaggy thing. But it's like the purlin, a beam. Don't worry about it. It's a beam. It is the type of beam that is working the least hard. So it is picking up DAC. We, we have DAC spanning in this direction. It's not drawn in here but we would know that that's DAC standing in that direction. These elements here are picking up our joists. What type of beam supports joists or purlins? Open web steel joists or purlins? A beam, a beam type beam. And then we could have girders, but we don't actually have any girders in this particular one. And that's gonna be a whole separate thing. We're gonna get into that again. Let's look at the tributary set. So let's talk right now about our J1, or roof joist O1. So that's this, this one right here. We've got this roof joist right here. It is this long. It, span, it starts here and it ends here. Each of these are bays of eight meters. So its length spans from here to here. So its length is eight meters, or its tributary length is eight meters. Its tributary width, like our table here, we know that if there's DAC going from this joist to this joist to this joist, this joist is picking up half of this space and half of this space. Or this, if imagine we draw that imaginary dotted line right down here and right down here. Now, we know that there are 18 sections, or sorry, there are nine sections in here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Each one of these bays is three meters, or sorry, six meters, so the total length here is 18. Every gap is two meters, so that means we're picking up a meter right here, and we're picking up a meter right here. The tributary width for this roof joist is two meters. Let's draw that in. We've got this tributary area. We've got the length of eight meters and our tributary width of two meters. So our tributary area is our eight meters times our two meters, or 16 meters squared. Are there any other elements that look like they're nine, that are eight meters long with a tributary width of two meters? Yeah, there's all kinds of them that look identical to this. Every single one of those is the exact same. All of those can be RJ01. 
So we really only need to design one thing, and we can design one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We can design 16 of them by designing one of them. Okay, let's look at this same plan and talk about our beams. Let's talk about roof beam one. Well, roof beam one goes from grid line A to grid line B. Each one of these spacings is six meters. So, RBO one is six meters long. We know that it is picking up these joists. So it is picking up half of this. Imagine if, you guys can't see what I'm about to do. Imagine if we ignored all of this for just a second, ignore all of that, and this was just our table that had our beam at each end. We know that a quarter of this whole bay right here goes into each column. But if we put a beam here and here, like we saw in that table example that I showed you, you know intuitively that half of this whole zone, we would draw an imaginary dotted line here, and half of it goes to RBO1. Well, that is our tributary width for RBO1. This spacing is eight meters, so half of it is four meters. So RBO1 is a length of six meters, its tributary width is half of eight meters or four meters and its tributary area is six times four or 24 meters squared. Are there any other beams that look identical to RBO1 that are six meters long and have a four meter tributary width? Yep, we've got five more of them. There's six of them that are identical here. Let's talk about RBO2. So RBO2 is, same as RBO1, six meters long, but it's picking up half of this bay right here, but it's also picking up half of this bay. So it's picking up half of this dimension, or this tributary width right here, so eight divided by two, and right here is eight divided by two, or eight meters. So we have six meters long, um, uh, sorry, we have six meters long, and we have eight divided by two plus eight divided by two equals eight meters. So this is eight meters right here. And our tributary area is six meters times eight meters, or 48 meters squared. We have two others that look identical to that. Let's take it just a little bit further. Let's look at the columns. Now the columns we know are a little bit easier. You can assume they're taking a quarter of each of the bays that they're supporting. Remember we did that with the table. Well now just imagine that you have multiple tables connecting in at the columns. And we also know that it was like half of these beams were going to each one. They've told us that we have a load on our roof. They have given us a UDS, or an ultimate dead and snow case. That means this is a factored load. UDS means it's factored. So whatever we do with this, we know that we could probably use the subscript F to talk about it. So let's talk about some of these columns. Let's look at column one. Well, column one should be supporting a quarter of this area here. So half of the A to B dimension, which is six, and half of the one to two dimension, which is eight. So we've got this area right here. So we've got three meters times four meters is 12 meters squared. They've told us that there are three kilonewtons on every meter squared of this portion right here. So imagine if this is 12 meters squared. Imagine if we drew this into 12 little squares. If we cut this up into 12 little squares, each square is supporting three kilonewtons. So if we did that, we could say that we have our 3 kPa times our 12 meters squared, or 36 kilonewtons. This column is supporting this tributary area and that, the load on it is 3 kPa, or 3 kilonewtons per meter squared, 
which means it's 36 kilonewtons. So we also know that that 3 kPa was a factored load, so the compression on that column is a factored compressive load of 36 kilonewtons. Our only job now would be to figure out what the reduced capacity of the actual column that's there and make sure it is greater than this factored compressive load. Are there any other columns that look identical to this, that have um, a tributary area of 12 meters squared um, that look identical? Well, yeah, we've got uh, three others that look identical to this. Let's talk about column two. Well, column two is picking up a quarter of this bay and a quarter of this bay. So it's picking up half of this length, so from here to here, which is eight divided by two, and it's picking up half of this six meters and half of this six meters. So three meters and three meters. Let's take a look. We can draw that in. There's the tributary area. So we have six divided by two plus six divided by two for our entire six meters. We have eight divided by two uh, for four meters right here is this dimension. So six by four is 24 meters squared. That's like saying we have 24 little squares that are each one meter by one meter. We know that three kPa is the same as one or three, we know that three kPa is the same as three kilonewtons on every meter squared, and we have 24 of those meters squared, so three times 24 equals 72 kilonewtons. Do you see any of these that look identical to this? Yeah, I see two more. They have the exact same tributary area and shape of tributary area. Let's look at C3. So column C3 is picking up a quarter of this bay and a quarter of this bay. So it's picking up this zone and this zone. So half of our six meters and then half of our eight meters plus half of our eight meters. So we can draw that in. Let's draw in that tributary area. We've got uh, uh, three meters and we've got eight meters. Well, three times eight is 24. Huh, look at that. Those are both 24 meters squared that they're supporting. They look a little different, their shape's a little different, but they have the same tributary area. And we're saying we could cut this up into 24 areas that are one meter by one meter. We have three kPa acting on that, which means for every one meter by one meter squared, we have three kilonewtons acting on it. And if we have 24 of those with three kilonewtons on each one, we have three times 24 equals 72 kilonewtons acting on this tributary area. Again, we've got one that looks identical to that right over here. Let's talk about column four. Well, column four is supporting a quarter of this bay, a quarter of this bay, a quarter of this bay, and a quarter of this bay or that's three meters and that's three meters, so a total dimension of six, and that's four meters and that's four meters, so a total dimension of eight. So we've got six times eight as our tributary area. Let's draw that in there. We've got six times eight as our tributary area, or 48 meters squared. We could cut this up into 48 little one meter by one meter squares, and we know that every one meter by one meter squared is supporting three kilonewtons. So three times 48 equals 144 kilonewtons on that tributary area, which is supported by that column C4. We have another C4 that also looks identical. So that's it. We've broken down the joists, we've broken down the beams, and we've broken down the columns. I'm not going to make you figure out what the loads on those things are. We'll get into that a little bit further um, in the term um, for the beams. But for right now, I wanted to show you uh, a practical application of why we worry about tributary area 
And if we know what that factor load that we figured out earlier in our lecture was, we can figure out what the factored compressive resistance on a column is, for example. You can have some crazy tributary areas for things. Look at that. Over here, it's picking up half of this tributary length and half of this tributary length. So we've got our point there. Over here, this one's short and this one's long. But what's funny is that total dimension and that total dimension is identical. Gets even crazier. Watch this. If we draw half of this bay, or not half, but the, if we cut the tributary in half for all of these and for all of these, we actually end up with the exact same parallelogram on all three of these beams. These two look identical, these two look identical, and these two look identical. I'm not going to make you do anything quite that complicated. You are going to do some activities where you look at tributary area and tributary width and one for a column on a simple plan that I've given you in the assignment and or quiz. But it's as simple as what I've just shown you. Just follow that process that I just showed you and you'll be fine. All right, enjoy the rest of your tutorial.